Welcome to this online presentation called Meaning Making, Meaning Shaping, Meaning Connect Making Connections Across Narratives, which is about recognising the importance of connecting ideas and aspects of story across a narrative as you tell it. I've called this uh, online presentation Meaning Making, Meaning Shaping, um, because that's what we do. We make meaning. We are constantly searching for meaning in the world around us. And when people talk to us, we look for meaning within what they say and we expect to find it. So here we have the words of Bruner, who is my academic hero, when he says, we characteristically assume that what somebody says must make sense. And we will, when in doubt about what sense it makes, search for or invent an interpretation of the utterance to give it sense. So in other words, if you're telling a story to people and you miss out a vital fact that means they can't make sense of the, uh, the events as they occur, then people will be questioning. They'll be asking themselves, why don't I understand that? Where is that piece of information that I need in order to understand this story? Now, it could be, of course, that you as a storyteller have decided to miss something out specifically to make the audience do that and manipulate the audience in that way. And that's fine. But to be able to do that, you actually need to be able to understand how to create the connections in the first place. To give some structure to this discussion, I'm going to use um, a, a book by uh, Kemper on the development of narrative skills, which looks at how children develop their ability to tell and understand stories. And one of the ways that that is measured um, when listening to children tell stories is looking at the, the connections that they make between actions, mental states and physical states. And to explain that, I'm going to use a short story which will start on the next slide. So here is my short story, which I've decided to call Peril in Mansfield. And a little bit of background information. I graduated from Roehampton many years ago, but before going into teaching, I ran away to theatre school and became an actor and formed a small touring company with a group of friends of mine. And we were a theatre and education company visiting schools. And we also went and toured around churches all over the country and sometimes abroad as well. So uh, we were on tour in Nottinghamshire and we were visiting a town called Mansfield which is just there and we were working in a church and we'd turned the church hall into a theatre we had theatre lights and uh, sound equipment the whole whole kit and caboodle and um, the show was going to start in about half an hour so I did what you do when you're going to do an hour and a half show uh, I paid a visit um, very sensibly and so I went to the gents toilet and there was a row of cubicles and I went into a cubicle and I will skip over the next part of the story and pick it up where I flushed and tried to get out of the loo and the door was stuck and no matter what I did I couldn't unlock the door so I climbed onto the toilet to load the toilet seat climbed onto it and then climbed up the wall and ended up horizontally with my face against body and face against the ceiling so I could twist round and drop on the other side of the separating wall between me at that cubicle and the one next door. Luckily, no one was in it. So um, I slid into the next cubicle and as I slid into the next cubicle, I heard the music change from the audience is coming in music to the you're about to go on stage music. And so I opened the door, which luckily worked, ran out of the toilet, ran up the stairs, ran backstage and ran on stage just in time to say my first line. And um, that's my story of peril in Mansfield. Returning to this uh, model from Kemper's work of action, mental state and physical state, we can see how we act in response to a mental state or response to a physical state or we act and that results in a mental state or a physical state or we are in a physical state and that can lead to a mental state or a mental state can lead to a physical state. Let's unpack it with that uh, short story of Peril in Mansfield and see how it works. So now we're going to unpick 
aspects of that story and look at what I've included and what I've excluded and the connections that are made within that story using uh, Kemper's idea of the links between action, mental state and physical state. Prior to trying the lock, uh, there was no reason for me to feel stress um, in the toilet cubicle. It is only when I tried the lock and found the door wouldn't open that my mental state changed and I started getting stressed because I knew that I needed to get on stage. So the action of trying the lock led to a particular mental state of being stressed. The action of trying the lock, becoming more forceful in that action, trying desperately to pull on the door, then resulted in my physical state changing with the heightened um, blood pressure and the, and, and the heart rate increasing. So we see action leading to physical state there. Now, finding that the door wouldn't open and getting stressed about that, of course, raised my heart rate and my blood pressure. So the mental state then had an effect on my physical state. And the raised blood pressure and the um, faster heart rate, of course, then circulates again around affecting my mental state. So you can see how these things act on each other. So here are the possible combinations um, that an action can lead to a physical state or a mental state. A physical state can lead to a mental state or an action. Or a mental state can lead to an action or, now this one you'll notice is in italics and in a box, a mental state can lead to a physical state. Now the reason that's in italics and uh, in a box is because Kemper is absolutely explicit saying that that cannot happen. That a mental state needs to lead to an action which leads to a physical state. However... I would suggest that um, modern thinking um, says to us that mental states can lead to physical states. And somebody who, uh, speaking of someone who has migraine, um, I know exactly that stress can lead to a physical state with no intervening action on my part. So uh, I've included that one. Now, there's an awful lot here, and you're not going to include every single one of these in every story, you, every moment of every story you tell. So the question is, how do you decide what you're going to include, what you're going to exclude? So that's where we're going with this discussion now. In a narrative, things happen for reasons. People want to achieve something for a reason. They want to take food to grandma in the forest because grandma's sick and there are things that try to stop them achieving this which may be the wolf and things that will actually help them which will be either the woodcutter or little red riding hood's own um, tenacity and intelligence depending on which version you read and so to look at the way of cause and effect it can be mapped out in story i like this way of thinking which is from robertson et al's book inside stories a narrative journey which is a book i would highly recommend to anyone and they provide this diagram however there is a change i want to make um before using it you will see the um, circles uh, interlocking and um, the arrows flow round so that you go if we start with the cause at the top left it goes cause to effect to reflection upon that effect which leads to action which is a cause of another effect etc etc and on the right hand side it says character change on the left hand side it says world change and i want to suggest a slight modification on this diagram just from my own experience of using it with students i think that phrase world change is very grandiose and um, prevents us from seeing things in the, the minutiae of how things change for a character in a story. So I want to remove that and replace it with a slight modifi modif modify modification of the diagram with change in the world as opposed to a, a world change. So a change in the world. Something has happened in the physical realm that has either been caused by character change or then causes character change. So starting from that top left-hand corner, from the idea of cause and going back to my story, that a cause in the world is that the door of the toilet stuck. And from that point of the cause, this had an effect in the world, that physically I could not get out of the toilet cubicle, I could not pass through that doorway. Now, when that happened to me, I had to do something about that because I needed to get out. 
And so there's that aspect of reflection that, oh my goodness, I need to get out of here. The music is going to change and I'm needed on stage any moment now. And so I acted. I climbed up the wall and dropped the other side of the door. And we could keep going because that changes a new cause in the world. A new a physical reality for the world is that I am the right side of the door. The effect of, is that I am actually free to uh, to go where I want to go. I, ref I realise that and reflect on that and go, now I need to run. So my act is to run onto the stage. I reach the stage, which is a cause, the effect of which is that I can begin my um, lines. The reflection on that is now I start speaking because my colleague is there on stage waiting for me and I act and I start speaking my lines. And you can see how one thing leads into another very, very smoothly. So do we need to include all of this stuff? Because actually... If we include absolutely everything, then we are going to stop. The story is going to grind to a halt as we concentrate on every little thing. So, for instance, if we go from this point here, I acted, I climbed up the wall, and I climbed up the wall and just stopped there and go, so now my cause is I am on top of the wall, which the effect is that I am stuck in the wrong position, and I reflect on that and go that I need to drop to the floor, so I act, so I drop to the floor. And we could break up every little thing and do this. And if we did that, the story would be interminable. So we have to make choices about what we need to include and what we don't need to include. And I like this diagram because it allows us to look at it and go, is my story making sense? Is it logical? Is the progression logical as I'm going th through the story? So how do we decide what to miss out? Well, at the beginning of the story, I told you that I graduated as a teacher and then I went on to form a theatre company. But I gave you some additional information before that because I told you that I went to theatre school and trained in mime and physical theatre before I formed the theatre company. So a, a graduating as a teacher is an action which led on to me training in mime and physical theatre which is another action which led on to me forming a theatre company which is another action now of course there were mental processes between those things um, but actually you don't need to know those I am sh I am editing the story down to tell you only what you need to know here and because this is contextualizing you don't need to have the mo mental processes because we don't need to focus on that particular those particular moments in the story we are saving that focus for later on, for the part of the story I want you to get involved with and the part of the story I'm going to concentrate on. To help us think about what we're going to leave out and what we're going to keep in when we are uh, plotting a story and which elements we're going to include in the story, we're going to return now to Kemper's model and the relationship between physical state, mental state and action. But let's come back to Kemper's uh, categories of of uh, cause and effect in story. And uh, she's quite clear that an action cannot lead to an action. And yet, when I was telling the story, I'm t saying to you that I try to unlock the door and then I turn the, the, door, the, the lock both ways. I turn it one way, then I turn it the other. Now, in there, there has to be a realisation that the door won't open. There has to be that mental realisation that the lock is stuck. Now, I don't put that in the story. I leave that for you, the audience, to work out. Because you know that there must be a mental reaction to understand that the door is locked. I'm relying on your knowledge of the world for you to be able to fill in a gap there. And that's done intentionally. It's not that uh, it's not that there's a, such a big gap that you can't work it out because trying to unlock the door and then trying again moving the lock from one side to the other, you all understand that actually there's a realization that's led to trying the lock and moving it from one side to the other. So when we're telling a story, we are relying on the audience having tacit knowledge of the world, that when they come to a story, they are bringing their knowledge of the world and how things work. 
everybody, I suspect, in the audience when I tell this story to people uh, or when they watch this video have tried to unlock doors and have found either they're locked and they can't unlock them or they're trying to open them the wrong way. So you have that understanding of how the world works and you are bringing that to the story and I'm respecting you as an audience by allowing you to bring your knowledge. So what I am doing is implying that missing mental state and the audience is inferring it. And it's giving the audience space to infer, because if we tell the audience absolutely everything, they have no work to do and they become passive in the storytelling process. So it's quite complex deciding what you're going to put in and what you're going to leave out. So going back to that idea of cause and effect and making sure that the chain makes sense, that you're, we understand why characters or groups of characters do things they do things for particular reasons they have they they do things that rely on them making mental decisions about things so that they act in the world and they do this because of something causes them to do it so I really want to finish on this quote from Kemper's work. Uh, it's quite a big quote, so I'm going to break it up and look at it in little sections. Storytellers must not only master the construction of hierarchically organised plots, but they must also master the construction of causally ordered sequences of events. So in other words, we as meaning makers are looking for things to make sense for us, which means that when people do things, they do them for a reason. When people react, they are reacting to something, and we understand that. Now, it could be, of course, you decide to leave something out because you want the audience not to know and want them to puzzle about it, and then you'll answer what was missing later on in the story. Or it could be that you put something in early in the story to hint. So, for instance, when I'm telling one of the stories from the Decameron, the Italian collection of stories, um, which is based on the myth of Pyramus and Thisbe, the same myth that Romeo and Juliet is based on, I give one of the characters a goblet, a silver goblet, on which there is etched figures from Greek mythology, and those are the figures of Pyramus and Thisbe, because I want to foreshadow what's going to happen later on in the story. And then she goes on to say, not only must the storyteller describe the protagonist's actions, but the storyteller must explain the character's motives. Why are they doing what they're doing? The circumstances that make some actions possible and render others impossible. And these result in characters' actions. So thinking of, of the typical sort of quest where someone picks up an article or they're given an article or a piece of information and we don't know why, but that later on enables them to do something. So it might be they're given a magic sword early on in the story and we don't find out till later on that actually without that magic sword they cannot complete the action they want to complete and that they rely on, the complete, on that magic sword to be able to complete their quest. So we're making those links across the story and they're sometimes separated so they could find the sword at the beginning of the story and not use it till the end. Um, and when I'm telling stories like that I will often remind the audience of something like the presence of that sword so that it keeps coming back and they're reminded of that object that will enable the story to resolve at the end. And the final point to make is that whilst as storytellers we can explicitly state those causal connections between states and actions, we can also require the listener to infer them and by giving those spaces for the audience to infer we are inviting them in to help construct the story themselves rather than telling them absolutely everything and giving them everything on a plate however the thing to remember is the story still needs to make sense and make sense through cause and effect either explicitly through us telling the audience or implicitly through us implying and the audience inferring